Welcome to Robotics and Automation News webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. Hello and welcome to another Robotics and Automation News interview. My name is Abdul Montakim. I'm editor of the website. And this interview is one of the most enjoyable I've done for a while. It's with Anton Zajac, founder of a company called Klein Vision, which has designed and built a flying car, which they've called simply Air Car. There's been a small number of inventors and companies who have designed and built flying cars over the past few decades. But a couple of key differences between their efforts and the Air Car from Klein Vision is that this one has recently received permission to operate within Europe by the relevant authorities, which Anton explains in the interview. Additionally, in my opinion, this is one of the most stylish looking ones out of all of them. No surprise that the designers have backgrounds in supercar design. Anyway, here's the interview. My name is Anton Zajak. Uh, I'm a, a theoretical physicist. Uh, uh, my background is in theoretical physics and uh, uh, today I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded, co-founded uh, several companies, some of which are uh, have been quite successful. The big, the, the the biggest one is probably ESET, which is a cybersecurity company, and um, another would be uh, uh, Slido, which uh, uh, was acquired by Cisco for nine-digit figure and uh, surge logs and many other companies. Uh, currently, I'm still uh, wearing several hats. Uh, one is in ESET, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, the cybersecurity company, but I'm only on, the, you know, acting as a board member. Uh, but I'm looking at different technologies and I, I um, uh, looked at the air car I met with Professor Klein uh, in 2015. And since in my first job, in my first life, I, I actually worked uh, uh, in the era of compute, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, the uh, project of an, of an air car was quite interesting. And uh, I also wanted to learn flying. So I... Uh, uh, I with uh, Stefan. Uh, no, Stefan suggested an instructor, and I, I got my private pilot, pilot license. I, I bought my plane, and uh, I I began a big supporter of aviation, and uh, I'm supporting women uh, learning and and license acquisition uh, in U.S. and and Slovakia. Uh, I worked uh, at uh, several universities in Mexico and in uh, San Diego and California. And uh, I'm just trying to have fun lately. And uh, you know, this project is something that is very exciting. And uh, what's really exciting is the fact that we have acquired the certificate of airworthiness uh, from Slovak Aviation Agency, which is an official uh, official authority uh, appointed by by uh, Slovakia, which is an uh, EU member state, and uh, it's an authority that is authorized to issue certification based on EASA standards. So uh, that's the in introduction. I, I don't know what uh, whether you have uh, other questions or I have loads of questions. I think you, what you're doing is absolutely fantastic and. Obviously, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks that because I've seen it on mainstream news and the television and everything. Everybody's very excited about this. This kind of thing has been talked about for many, many years. But I think the key reason why people are picking up the story now is because of the certification. Now, let me ask you quickly. I mean, we'll go into the website. Uh, I found a website. I hope it's the appropriate website, but I'll share my screen and we'll go to the website and we'll talk about that as well and maybe see a video of the of the flying car but uh, just quickly as a technical question or regulatory question 
Um, the certification that you've received in Slovakia, does that apply, does that make it airworthy in other EU countries as well and beyond? Of course, uh, every member uh, country or yeah, of EASA uh, recognizes that uh, certification and also uh, other countries which are members of uh, ICAO organization, uh, international organization, uh, uh, would recognize that certification because EASA regulations are based on ICAO standards. And uh, so uh, the process, it doesn't make sense to reinvent the, the wheel in every particular country. There has to be certain level of uniformity and, and, and you know, the standards must be uh, on the same level. Uh, and that's why the uh, certification in Slovakia uh, is valid in other countries because it is uh, based on EASA standards. But I, I must say that if we want to fly from Slovakia to, let's say, Hungary or UK or anywhere else with this type of certification, we need uh, to send a letter to local certification authority uh, in UK, it would be the civil aviation authority or, uh, you know, the, the Austria control in Aust Aust Austria. And this is done by many companies uh, who, uh, which uh, create so-called experimental kits. And uh, for example, there's a company Aerospool in uh, a city of Previza, which uh, makes uh, uh, dynamic and Advantic aircrafts, and those are well. The Advantic is experimental aircraft, uh, and uh, if that aircraft wants to fly to other country, uh, the pilot needs to file a flight plan and request uh, permission to fly over that airspace of that uh, other country, and that that permit is issued and is valid for one year. So. So uh, that's a very standard approach. And the word experimental doesn't mean that, you know, we are experimenting with the aircraft. It's just a technical term. It's a, um, you know, uh, defined term what an experimental aircraft means. And for example, RV or th there are many companies even in the, United, in the United States which create experimental aircraft and sell them worldwide. And those aircrafts can fly over any airspace. Now, um, that's more of a, uh, I suppose, sort of uh, political or um, administrative thing, the idea of getting permission to fly in somebody's airspace. I mean, even though it's one big union of countries, there's still probably some regulations regarding that. It's not. Uh, technical thing where it, it questions your airworthiness or anything like that. That's a, that's a separate issue, um, it, it, as far as I understand it anyway. But let me ask you one more technical question before we go into the website. Um, um, is there some sort of a limits or kind of guidance about how high the, the vehicle flies uh, uh, and what kind of uh, constraints perhaps do the, the, uh, the you have to operate within? Okay, so so uh, small or light aircraft uh, usually have an operating uh, limit a level of eighteen thousand feet, and we can fly to eighteen thousand feet as well. Uh, above that uh, level, the aircraft would not be certified or insured. Uh, of course, if you fly over ten thousand feet, you need to, uh, and you stay there for longer than ten minutes, you need to have a oxygen uh, device uh, because uh, that's a regulation. Uh, for example, I have a Diamond aircraft, Diamond 42, and when I'm above 10,000 uh, feet, I need to uh, have oxygen ready. And if I, if I stay in higher altitudes, uh, then I need to use it actually. Uh, and the same is ap applicable to air car. Air car in a aircraft mode, is a fully fledged uh, aircraft. Okay, let's uh, go on to the website uh, now. And um, where is it? 
we, we didn't have a reason to fly to 18,000 feet. Uh, the, the top height that we achieved uh, was 8,000, uh, I think 200 feet. However, we could fly higher, but uh, it doesn't make sense. We are not, uh, we don't need to test how high it would fly. Uh, we, uh, the program that uh, the, the certification required certain set of maneuvers. And uh, so uh, we, you don't, uh, there's not, not no, no maneuver that you need to fly to 18,000 feet. Uh, so we, 8,200 8, uh, feet was enough for all the maneuvers which we wanted to test. Well, the, re the reason I ask is because um, uh, when, for example, if I was to buy, I mean, obviously I'd never be able to afford something like this, but if, you know, if my dream comes true and I have a lot of money and uh, if I buy the car, uh, I live in the country and wh what would I, what would you tell me in terms of what, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, what, what, how would you guide me? Would you say stay within 5,000 feet ab above above a thousand feet so you clear the houses and maybe other buildings and uh, below 5,000 feet. What's the optimum kind of, how, how does uh, one operate? This is a completely new device only seen in films like uh, uh, The Fifth Element and things like that. But we'll get onto kind of flights of fancy like that. But what are the practical, what are the practical advice tips you would give to someone who uh, buys your car and wants to uh, operate it? So, uh... It really depends where you want to fly and what the weather is looks like, uh, what the what airspace you are flying over. There's there's a number of factors that you need to take into account when you want to fly from A to B. Uh, in general, uh, you know, I would su suggest uh, you need to be one thousand. You need to clear the obstacles by one thousand feet, and that's it. Uh, now, it also depends what is your rating as a pilot. You might, you might have a VFR rating, which is visual flight rules, and you can only fly if you can see the land. So you, you, you may fly when there is certain uh, you know, amount of clouds on the, on the sky, but, but if it's completely uh, covered with, sky, uh, with, uh, with clouds, you must fly below the, 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 uh, the clouds. If you have IFR, instrument flight uh, rating, then you can fly even in the clouds, or you can just uh, penetrate the clouds and, and fly above the clouds up to the operating, maximum operating level, which would be 18,000 feet. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I, this is my level of ignorance, I suppose. I, I, it didn't occur to me that I'd, I would need or one would need a flight, uh, flight, a flying license or a pilot's license in order to operate this thing. Uh, it is a car. I have a driving <laughs> driving license, and not, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll have to get a, a pilot's license. Let's play this video. I can't wait to play this video, and uh, you know maybe you can talk us uh, through it. I'll mute it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's um, as I say, it's caught a lot of people's imagination. I mean, how long did it take you to design and develop? Uh, yeah. So so. Uh, uh, I just wanted to make one more comment regarding the, the license. You would need about 50 hours of flight, 30 hours of flight to get the license. And, and we can provide you the training. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you, you need to then pass uh, tests, uh, the, the, sk the skill test and also theoretical tests from seven subjects. Uh, which are not very easy, but uh, of course the safety is the primary concern. Now uh, we started the, it's a long story. Uh, this is the fifth prototype, prototype number five. And the first prototype was built by Professor Klein in 1989. And uh, uh, this prototype, 
uh, was built uh, from 19, uh, from uh, 2017. And uh, we did the first flight in on this prototype in uh, 2020, 2020 in uh, September. So it took us uh, three, uh, three plus, plus years. Mm. The car itself, what, what uh, model of car did you buy? Tell us a little bit about the technology. I don't know if you can, um, yeah, I don't know, you probably need to keep some things uh, confidential, but what, 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 what is the technology that has gone into this? The car, I don't quite recognize it, but it looks like a recognizable car, the base, <laughs> base model. <laughs> well, you wouldn't find such a car on the market. Uh, uh, Stefan, uh, Professor Klein, he, he's a, uh, he has uh, done a lot of design for, uh, for Audi and other car brands. And uh, you may have seen uh, Bugatti Veyron. And mm -hmm. Bugatti, Bugatti Veyron is a product, is, has been designed by Professor Klein's student. Right. Now, now well, this Bugatti, car... Bugatti is uh, millions of dollars, aren't they? Bugatti cars, they cost a lot of money. Uh, half a million to a million dollars, don't they, or, or not? These cars? Bugatti, Bugatti. The, yeah, yeah, they, they co they, they, I think they cost a million, yeah. yeah. They cost a million. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, if you look at uh, old cars from the, che from the from former Czechoslovakia, there was one car called Tatra. Ta Tatra. And okay. that car, that car had a big problem. When it was driving fast, fast, it was very unstable on the road. It was, it had an inclination to fly. And so when, uh, uh, when Professor Klein uh, started with the design of this car, uh, he was, facing, he was facing the following dilemma. How to create a car, a flying car, that would actually have a size of a car when it's in the mo mode of a car. Uh, so, uh, because if, if, if you want a 1000 kilogram car to fly, you need certain uh, surface, of the wing of the wings, certain dimension of the wings, and uh, to make uh, if if you have a, a very large or long wings, it's very difficult to fold the wings to con to to transform the aircraft into a car, and the goal was to create a slick looking sports car and a solid air, a, aircraft. And to do that, to, to create a sports, uh, to, to create a nice uh, appealing sports car, it can't be too big. So the trick to uh, the solution to this dilemma uh, was to create, a, to design the car in such a way that the car itself is a lifting body. So even if you remove the wings, and you put that car into the body of the car into a wind tunnel, you would observe a lifting force. So because of the, uh, be, be, so one third of the lifting force is actually generated by the, by the body of the car. That's why the wings don't have to be so long. And when you look at the transformation from uh, the air aircraft to, at the car mode, you see that not only the wings are folded, but also the tail goes inside. It, so so uh, this is a trick, which is a patented you know, technology, which uh, actually transform the aircraft into a car mode, uh, which you can park in your garage. Uh, I can see what you're saying now, just to... Rewind a little bit. So the wings are going 
you know, they are they were folded and then, then they so go upward. Yeah, so the back of the wings uh, fold upwards first, and then the the axis there turns. So the whole thing, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, and now it's moving forward. So in, ingenious, so, absolutely ingenious. Yeah. So so the width of the car is uh, two meters, and the length is uh, a little bit more than five meters, which is an S class. Mercedes Benz, uh, and you you can park that in any parking spot in any uh, any shopping center or or any garage of any house. So it's a very you know that that criteria to create a very stable vehicle, uh, and and also uh, a vehicle that looks like a sports car uh, was a was a goal and and. Um, you know there are there are two certified objects that are called that are that the companies call a flying car. One is uh, Pal V, and the second one is Terrafugia. Uh, Pal V is actually a tricycle. It's a gyrocopter. It's I don't think it's a flying car. It, they call it a flying car. It can it can actually uh, move on the road. And it can fly, uh, but but it's not a sports car, and you can't, you know, it doesn't go fast. It's not very stable, and because it only has three wheels, uh, whereas Terrafugia, it has four wheels. However, the uh, the wings are folded in in a, in a most uh, incredible way, and the center of gravity of the of Terra Fuja is so high that uh, in the you know in, in when you turn uh, you you must have a very low speed to avoid uh, you know um, uh, to avoid any accident and also the the side wing winds are very uh, dangerous for 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 that uh, for Terra Fuja when it when it when it moves on the road. So these are two other organizations or companies. Uh, I'll look them up later. Uh, but I have seen over the years, many years ago, I've seen, uh, you know, uh, flying car, pictures of flying cars. And uh, I think was one I, I'm thinking of was in a magazine uh, many years ago, but, and it was an American inventor or someone who did it. And that didn't look anywhere near as attractive as this in terms of as a car uh, to begin with. I mean, this looks like a very, very, you know, really very nice, uh, you know, sports car on its own. And um, obviously the, you know, adding the wings and things like that, making it fly is just a, transforms it into a plane, which and as a plane, it looks, uh, looks good as well. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a you know congratulations on what is a terrific uh, achievement in terms of design, in terms of looking at it. But obviously, engineering wise, that's also probably the or I'm sure it's the bigger achievement. But I suppose both things go hand in hand. You've talked about aerodynamics and how wind resistance matters, whether it's side on wind or front on wind. It's a it's a it's a you know it's an it, it's a it's a Big, big achievement. What kind of things, I know it took a long time and maybe lots of different types of software and lots of different types of systems and approaches, but what are the key things that help to design this in terms of software or hardware? Any yeah. new innovations that came along that made your life easier, new types of sensors perhaps, or, or okay. uh, new types of things, whatever they are? Yeah, so... Uh... The the digital the, the, so the, there's a number of different systems that have been used, uh, some of which are very standard system. For example, the software called Katya is a software that is used to digitize uh, different uh, products, and uh, Katya is used by by Airbus, for example, when they design their big planes. Uh, we used Katya to. Uh, to digitize uh, air car. Uh, there's a number of different systems uh, 
computer fluid dynamics, uh, computational fluid dynamics was used to simulate the airflow uh, around the, the air car. Calculations were done uh, at uh, university in Brno in the Czech Republic by, by top experts. Uh, they have a big tradition in this, this area. So uh, the, the results of the calculations were then tested on a model one-to-one, -one, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, 400 kilograms, uh, the weight of which was 400 kilograms, and it was powered by electric engine. We wanted to create a one-to-one -one model to ensure uh, the same Reynolds number uh, so that we would not be surprised when we create the real model. And you can see on this picture that you, you know there, there is some pieces of ropes on the on the wings. And though so we have cameras that are taking uh, they are shooting videos and we see the actual airflow around the wings. And uh, those were this is a real prototype, but uh, we had similar uh situation and and process in uh, with the model one to one and uh, all the calculations that we did before we flew the the model one to one were confirmed by the real you know numbers that we measured during the uh, during the the simulation and uh, and testing of the model and uh so we calculated for example the rotational speed, the speed at which the car should take off. Uh, and it was spot on. It was, uh, you know, plus minus a few kilometers, but the calculations were confirmed by our measurements. And so we know uh, the, uh, the, the calculations were actually correct. But not what, only that- what is, what, what is the takeoff speed? Sorry to interrupt. What is the takeoff yeah, it's, speed? Yeah, the takeoff speed depends on whether you are on the grass or on a hard surface. Uh, it also depends mainly on the flaps. So uh, uh, without with zero flaps, uh, it's higher than with uh, you know there are three positions for the flaps, and uh, uh, so the the rotation speed is one hundred fifteen kilometers per hour. Uh, now, just one more uh, thing regarding the simulations and calculations. Uh, each each uh, unit or each piece of the, the, which is important in that uh, flying car uh, was calculated its mechanical properties were calculated using finite element method. So each um, bolt or whatever is important and must must uh, you know uh, must be uh, reliable uh, was calculated using using you know standards finite element methods. So uh, you know we have thousands and thousands of of, of uh, calculations and drawings showing. The stress lines and and uh, it, it's a it's a scientific uh, really a scientific project, and of course the certification would not have been achieved unless we had all these calculations which we could present and defend, uh, you know, in front of the authorities. It's very rigorously monitored process, and uh, we are really happy that we have achieved the. Uh, certification because it's an official uh, official confirmation of the concept and our ability to create a real uh, flying car that can be offered to the market. Mm, absolutely amazing. I, I find uh, I don't know enough about uh, the, I'd love to be able to do that. I've designed magazines and newspapers for many years but i'd love to learn how to design 3d things and learn how to use the simulation software and because there's so many new things out now and 
I would imagine they take huge amounts of memory and data, and uh, there's a lot of paperwork and documentation involved. So yes, as I say, it's a it's a big achievement, I, I think. Uh, but let's so, jump to you the. You know, if, if you want, if you really, if you wanted to visit us, uh, we can lead you through the process. We can show you how uh, the whole uh, design works, and and we can show you the screens of our computers and. Uh, it's uh, you know you can you can sit in the uh, car and and we can we can have, even take off. <laughs> that would be, that would be I don't I, 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 that would be absolutely amazing. Let's see. Let's uh, hope that a lot of this uh, coronavirus goes away and maybe in summer. Uh, I usually go to European events, uh, trade shows, and things like that. I don't know which trade show your uh you know your vehicle your plane car car plane air, air car uh, fits into but i'm i'm sure i'll see it around and I'd absolutely uh, thank you very much for the offer i uh, i would i definitely say yes but let's uh, let's hope it seems too good to be true but uh, there's, there's a couple of questions i should ask uh, one is that um the, the market for this kind of thing, obviously, you know, it is a business, scientific uh, and, and technological achievement as, uh, as much as it, as it is. Um, in the, I'm sure you've seen a film called uh, uh, The Fifth Element. There are flying cars all over the city, the futuristic city in the film. Um, it is not exactly the same in terms of design, but this kind of thing, I imagine, that it's going to become more and more popular. Uh, and with the availability of um, a collision avoidance technology these days and LIDAR and sensors to make sure that people, you know, robots don't crash into each other, uh, I think it's feasible that that kind of scenario that was in the film would be achievable. Well, you know, we can probably see it, maybe not in our lifetime. I don't know if you agree, but uh, at some point in the future, you'll see flying cars all over the city. So there is a big potential market, maybe decades in advance. Well, what's your view? Uh, what, 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 how do you see the market sort of developing for this type of vehicle? So uh, I, I could give you my predictions, but uh, there are companies that are in business of making predictions, such as Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley predicted that uh, the uh, flying car industry will uh, reach the size of 2.9 trillions in 20 years. And uh, Market Research Institute uh, published uh, numbers and, and, and the numbers say that the industry will have the size of 7 billion in 2035 with 40% uh, uh, accumulated average growth rate, annual growth rate. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a theoretical physicist. I, I, can, I can do some projections. Uh, I know that there is about 220,000 private small planes uh, owned by individuals, private individuals in the United States. And, and out of the 220,000, I bet at least 5% will want to have a flying car. And if, if, if they do, we have a market of 10 billions. Uh, there is 30 million taxis uh, in the world. And if we only converted 0.01%, we have a business of 30 billion. And uh, I am sure uh, that is coming. I'm sure that is coming. And, you know, you, you have two approaches. Two, um, one approach is uh, so-called veto vehicles, vertical takeoff and landing. And then you have uh, uh, air cars like, uh, like, our, like, like our air car, which is strictly based on fixed wings, which generate the lift. And, they, and, and it can transform into a car. Uh, our approach is extremely energy efficient. Uh, the vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, the drones, uh, which usually are powered by, by a battery, they are very energy inefficient. Uh, they need to, they are moving vertical, you know, upwards or downwards most of the time. And they consume a lot of energy, whereas air car, uh, 
per one mile of, of transportation uses less energy than the vertical, uh, than the veto vehicle. So uh, I believe people will be looking at energy efficiency of what they use for transportation. Uh, the range of veto vehicles is very low and also the speed is very low. Uh, the new model that we are building will be flying at a speed of 300 kilometers an hour, which is a pretty fast, small aircraft. So, uh, to, uh, so, so the, the market is, um, uh, I, I believe, ready for uh, flying cars, uh, either as, you know, taxi or uh, private owners of, of uh, of, of air cars, since you can park this uh, in, in your garage, it's extremely convenient, especially if you live, uh, let's say in, in Maui and you want to fly to uh, other Hawaiian island, uh, you can cover this distance from your garage to your sister's house, for example, in one hour, whereas Fly, going by boat or, or by commercial airplane, it would take you five plus hours. So, so you, for certain situations, this uh, flying car is an excellent solution. And uh, when we look at uh, uh, the industry, the transportation industry, and, and especially aviation, uh, the rate at which the private uh, planes are being used skyrocketed during the COVID time and also availability of, of uh, small planes uh, is very limited. Even old ones uh, are hard to get. Let me ask you a couple of things that have come to mind. I, I should ask you, I'm sure it's on your website, but the um, landing and take of this, how, how, much, how much distance does it, does it take? And, uh, to land or to take off uh, in terms of length. I know you said the speed is about 118 kilometers or 180, I can't remember. But um, the other question I have is that I would imagine uh, two questions. One is uh, I would imagine it's quite easy to turn it into an autonomous thing. I know you said that you need pilot's license to operate it as a human being, but could it be converted into an autonomous flying uh, machine? And uh, my other question was just to, uh, I can't remember if you mentioned fuel. What type of fuel does it uh, take? Is it, is it uh, hydrogen or what was it you, you said? I can't remember. No, 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 it, it's, a few, it's a standard uh, oh, gas, okay. gas you can get at any gas station. Right. So, so, so let me answer your first question regarding the uh, landing and takeoff role. Uh, it depends on the surface. On a grass, you would need about 800 meters with a current engine. The stronger the engine, the shorter the, the uh, takeoff uh, distance. But with this very low, very, very uh, weak engine, you know, it's uh, 1.6 liter, 140 HP. It's a BMW, V4 uh, motorcycle engine, uh, you, need, you need about, on the grass, 800 meters. Uh, on asphalt or concrete, you need 550 meters, over five me 15 meter obstacle, okay? So otherwise it would be about 350. If you don't have any obstacles in front of the, of, of the, of the runway, uh, you need uh, 380 meters to take off. Uh, the next question was... Uh, Is it possible to turn it into an autonomous... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, this uh, prototype does not have an uh, autopilot, but, but adding an autopilot is a very straightforward procedure because uh, Garmin 1000, for example, NXI, those, uh, those are certified. And uh, so it's just a matter of implementing them in, 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 in the air car. 
it's 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 very easy. We don't have to go through the certification process. Uh, what what is more complex than the autopilot uh, is the procedure of transforming the aircraft into a car and vice versa. And we achieved that by implementing 28 servos, uh, which are computer uh, controlled. And uh, that's a very complex and patented process that has been achieved. Now, in terms of autonomous, uh, it's a, you know, it's a final goal. Uh, however, uh, currently you, you, you only have a few, only, you only have a few aircrafts uh, that uh, allow autonomous landing, for example. Uh, but uh, there are several aircrafts that have been tested but the biggest problem is to receive a uh, EASA or uh, other you know certification for such a system uh, you know even tesla uh, you you can't uh, ask your tesla to go to a shopping mall you you need to be there and you need to hold the steering wheel and it you know the company says you know it will go you know autonomously However, you, you still need to be there and, and monitor the system. Now, we, we landed and took off with the air car without touching the controls. So, you know, to a certain extent, uh, it is ready for, for automatic landing and, and takeoff. And once you have a, a, a Garmin 1000, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, program uh, uh, route and and, you, and, and the, the airplane, the autopilot will take will take you there, uh, which is the you know flight management system feature. Uh, but you know we yeah, eventually eventually that's a goal. But uh, we'll probably need to uh, partner with somebody who is who is uh, who is uh, really expert in that area. We are not. Uh, we are experts in in design and and uh, construction uh, and and software and uh, you know mechanical you know uh, engineering uh, but uh, you know it it's it definitely will become uh, a feature that will be needed uh, and once it's certified. Uh, you don't need a pilot's license. That, that's the big uh, advantage. Okay, well, I shouldn't take up more of your too many, too much more of your time because uh, I've already spent uh, 40 minutes with you. I'm sure you're a busy man. <laughs> you know, it's a fantastic business you, uh, you started. And, and um, you know, congratulations again on everything that you've achieved so far and all the attention. I think you'll. Uh, get you more, uh, a lot of orders, I imagine. I don't know if you have any orders uh, yet, but uh, let me ask you one last question about uh, regulation, broader regulation in terms of air corridors and, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the infrastructure, if you like, of, of uh, that will be conducive to the development of this market, these kind of vehicles. I'm interviewing somebody from, uh, the Michigan Development Corporation or something, an organization in Michigan, in, in the US, obviously, and they have recently agreed uh, to open what I think is called an air corridor for drones between Canada, a Canadian city, I think it's Ontario or something, a Canadian city and uh, the, the Michigan, I suppose. And it's for drones, I don't know what type of drones, but that kind of you know, air corridor obviously requires uh, political will and uh, imagination to put together and to manage and monitor. And that would be obviously very good for those drones and uh, maybe flying cars and all that uh, kind of thing will be included in that. But what's your view about uh, a broader sort of outlook that uh, politicians possibly or regulators can take in order to uh, 
uh, help this market grow, help these kind of vehicles to be operated in a more safer uh, context? Well, the good news is uh, we don't need any regulation for the aircraft mode because the regulations have already been adopted and are valid in, uh, in, uh, across the globe. So when, when air car is uh, in a mode of an aircraft, it follows all the regulations that have been already uh, formulated and also it takes advantage of all the infrastructure that has been already built. So for, for example, in the United States, there's 25,000 airports. In Europe, the density is also quite high and uh, an air car you know, can, can land on any of those airports or any private piece of land uh, which, uh, uh, where the owner allows it to land or take off. And that's a you know, great advantage because if the weather is bad, you land and you, you go like, you know, in a car. Uh, the second part uh, of the answer is related to the certification as a car. You know, because you know, even you know, the cars also need to comply with certain standards. One of which is, for example, the emission uh, standard. Now, the engine that is going to be implemented in, in the new model, which is being now developed, is called ADAPT engine. And it's a very uh, ecological engine produced in South Africa. And uh, 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 it complies with the emission standards on the, on the road. You know, when you drive it, this uh, aircraft, uh, this uh, air car on a road, uh, we are going to meet the emission standards. Uh, there is a category uh, called M1, uh, which is uh, 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 based on UK standards. You can create, you can, you can ma manufacture 100 cars a year and have them certified in this M1 category, which is our plan initially because that allows you to bypass certain uh, processes and steps such as crash tests. Uh, so we are going to certify this in M1 category in the, in the car mode and CS23 category in uh, aircraft mode. Okay, are you are you uh, allowed to say how many orders or, or anything that you've got uh, so far? Well, we have a we have a, a number of uh, very interested clients, uh, but we are not selling this at the moment uh, because we we need to finish the the new prototype which will have the avia aviation engine uh, that I just mentioned. And it will be a monocoque construction with a variable pitch propeller. So it will be the production prototype, which we expect to finish in uh, by the end of this year. Uh, then we need about two months to the flight tests. And then we can start uh, uh, production. Uh, and we plan to start uh, producing 100 pieces a year. Okay, well, I am so pleased uh, to have interviewed you and talked to you. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's great. These, these things are highlights of my uh, job um, to interview interesting people who are developing interesting technologies. So absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this market develops. Uh, is there anything that I should have asked about that you want to mention, that you want to add? Um, I think you pretty much covered the, you know, we could, uh, of course, have a, a three hour discussion or more. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good luck with your, I mean, the conference or all these events that you're going to go to, I imagine, I, 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 you're going to be, um, have a lot of interested uh, potential clients and buyers. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and interest. And, uh, 
uh, we'll continue, you know, providing you information on on uh, on new developments. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you. Have a have a nice day. To you. you too. Send us an email at sales at robotics and automationnews.com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.